into uh, our video series on experience design strategy. Um, in this series, we'll be talking to some global experts and leaders in, in uh, thinking and doing around experience design strategy. Uh, it's with great pleasure that our first um, uh, interview, interviewee is Paul Bryan, uh, a consultant, strategist and organiser of UX Strat conferences and masterclasses which are held around the world. Uh, thanks for joining us, Paul. Sure. Good to see you. Good to see you, Paul. Paul, uh, I've given you a brief introduction, but could you describe what you do? Uh, well, as you mentioned, I organize UX Strat, so we have um, events uh, like conferences in Europe, the USA, as well as master classes, uh, one-day workshops, two-day experience design workshops in different cities, mostly around Europe and um, and the USA. Uh, we've been to Asia, but uh, still in the plans for the future. And, and Paul, so one of the questions that I'm asking uh people that are sort of uh, involved in this series is, how did you get into experience design? Uh, well, because of my age, that's kind of a long answer, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll summarize. Um, I started designing websites in 1995, and I lived in Barcelona, worked for a small uh, web design company, um, and moved back to the U.S. a couple of years later, started working as an information architect for Sapient. They were kind of the top of the consulting pile back in the late 1990s. Um, I started my own consulting practice in 2002, doing mostly user research, ethnographic research, um, some quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, uh, the term user experience came about around the year 2000. Um, at Sapient, we were pretty quick to jump on that. Um, and so from the beginning, my consulting was around user experience. And then I started doing the events. Uh, we're in our fifth year now. So it's been, been a few years since um, more emphasis on events and a little less on the consulting side. When and why did you start thinking about experience design strategy? Uh, well, I had a project. I did a project for um, Lowe's.com, large retailer in the U.S. Uh, we were at a very tactical level with the company and doing usability studies, uh, doing heuristic evaluations, wireframes, task paths, um, interviews, etc. But um, they hired a new business strategist for Lowe's.com and uh, she was brilliant. She came from Darden, um, Liz Guthrie, and we started working together and realizing we had a lot in common, a lot of goals in common, and in order to affect the business side of e-commerce, we would have to do user experience a little differently. So we created a project um, way back in 2009 uh, called UX Strategy of Lowe's.com and I was the UX lead and she was the business lead and it was kind of like chocolate and peanut butter and so soon after that I started the LinkedIn group uh, UX Strategy and Planning kind of a niche uh, not really knowing what was going to happen to it today it's about 30,000 members so not huge um, not small uh, but confirmed in the idea that business strategy and experience design um, we're going to have to be related for companies uh, as they move into the new world of business at that time, 2009, 2010, etc. So, so when we think about uh, experience design strategy, how do you define experience design strategy? Well, I use actually your definition, Tim, uh, in my materials. So um, I'm going to just read that off of the workbook, How Does Tim Liu Define UX Strategy? <laughs> A long-term vision, roadmap, and key performance indicators to align every customer touchpoint with your brand position and business strategy. So those infamous words uh, are uh, in our materials. Um, I guess I get asked that a lot because, um, well, uh, people saying there's no such thing as UX strategy. It's actually an article I wrote a long time ago called There's No Such Thing as UX Strategy, but there should be. Is what I said at the time, back in 2012. Uh, I, th I think it's more around um, not necessarily UX strategy and what is that, but what is a thing and then a strategy that goes with it. There's strategy in every area of life. I'm on a very strict diet right now. Um, so the, I have a diet strategy. There's kind of food I keep around the office and other kinds of food I don't keep around the office. Um, on a tactical basis, I'm trying to refuse certain kinds of food, but on a strategic basis, I'm trying to 
have positive things around me and trying to reach my goals um, through that, uh, those efforts. And so I think strategy applies to every area of life. It just it has to do with um, using your resources to go from a current state that you're in to go to a future desired state. And it started with the military, uh, the word strategy. Um, so applying UX strategy to that or experience design XD strategy to that, I then just have to look at user experience and, um, and see how do I use my resources and user experience to, to win, to succeed, to get from where we are now to where we want to be. Uh, transforming that, I think, user and experience, I think um, the term's getting a little dated. Um, it's been 17 years now since I first heard it. Uh, and I think that um, the idea of a user with driverless cars and um, Internet of Things is a little bit outdated. Uh, so when I, I think experiences are never going to be outdated. Um, that human experience is just something that um, obviously that uh, is universal. So I think the shift to what you're saying, experience design uh, strategy, makes a lot of sense to me. Actually, uh, one of the th uh, things that you mentioned there was about a shift from user experience to experience design. I guess what, uh, and you've spent a lot of time thinking about that, I know, because we've spoken about this over the last two years, I think. I guess what, how did your, how did your thinking evolve over, the, um, over that? Well, again, I think the, when user experience came out, the idea that you're centering your efforts rather than a list of product features, rather on what people using the technology were thinking, feeling, needing, doing, um, was, was a revolution to, uh, to, to think that way, basically. And I think that the idea of a user experience often brings to mind screens, and whether it's a phone screen or a computer screen, UX seems tied to screens. Uh, so I, I think that um, in that sense, I don't think that's really a forward-looking term, but rather at that point it was, it was very useful, but now not as much. Um, also, I think that the career of user experience in the last few years when Agile took off, Lean UX, um, companies took a product focus, product management focus to uh, things that were designed within their companies. I think that was a big step backwards, actually. I think that although it's very efficient uh, and very meaningful, um, at the same time, the product is not the center. Uh, the, the service is not the center. The experience is the center. And so I think a, a move towards experience is the right direction to go in. Um, at the same time, in terms of experience, I'm mainly interested in design. So if I take those pieces together, our event has the, the word UX in it um, just because historically that's been important. It's still a growing field. Um, my advisors, like yourself, um, have uh, agreed that experience design is a broader, more future-looking term, but there's also a certain credibility and a certain um, uh, applicability that people feel with UX. And so there's sort of a, a river crossing that we're sort of in the middle of. This year we'll have um, some XD uh, events. We have XD Silicon Valley, XD Amsterdam, XD Hamburg, uh, XD Austin, XD Boston, etc. And those will be experience design events. Our flagship conferences will stay UX Strat this year, but at some point um, when the tipping point uh, for just the reach that we get is reached, um, then we'll switch that to XD Strat. Thanks, Paul. So what are the core elements of UX strategy planning or the strategy planning process? Uh, well, um, it's involving a lot more roles than it used to involve. And so as, as UX strategy or experience design strategy become a focus within a company, we don't only speak to team members on a product team. That's um, part of it, uh, but that's more on the execution side. On the strategy side, we're going upstream. I just got off the phone with a really well-known company in Europe, and it's exactly what they were saying is that we understand what we're doing in our team of designers and our product teams. We know what the approach is on execution. The problem is that we're not upstream in the planning at the concept phase and even the pre-concept phase. So I guess I feel like that's an important component of experience design strategy is moving upstream before their requirements, before their teams, before their timelines. And when maybe even the product manager isn't even named yet, 
um, that experienced design strategists get involved and begin to help set the, um, the equations in place, the practices in place that are going to yield to a, a product service experience that's designed and successful in the marketplace. And so I, I think that's a, a key element. Of course, the traditional elements of design, um, visual design, typography, information architecture, interaction design, uh, user research, those are all still content strategy. Those are all still pieces in that puzzle. Um, but that's been figured out, I think, for a while uh, on the execution side. I think on the strategy side, it's still quite new. And I would say in Europe, newer than in the U.S., that, um, that people focusing on experience design strategy should be interfacing with the business and should be at the table as decisions are made before the rest of the execution part even starts to roll out. That's interesting. I was having a discussion with one of my colleagues about methodology, and I think you're right. I think this idea that the how is starting to become quite, is mature. It's quite mature is in terms of working processes and skills. But the why and the what and the role of experience design in helping businesses shape that is still fairly early days, actually. Agreed. And the companies that are legacy companies, um, BMW, Home Depot, um, Tesco, uh, these legacy companies have built up either engineering departments or business strategies or operations. Those are very, you know, very muscular, very strong, very robust practices within the company. And so for experienced design professionals to move upstream and have an impact in those areas, I don't think it's an overnight process. I don't think it's from one day to the next, oh, come on in, you have an idea, let us help us guide the company. <laughs> it's just not happening that way. And so what the, the UX Strat events are about is how do you build up influence? How do you, what should you focus on? What are the pieces to put in place so that as you begin to have successes, then you're invited into a bigger and bigger role. But I treat it as a very gradual thing. In our workshops, I, at the very end, when we talk about communication, um, I say that this is not an immediate process. You have to do homework. Maybe you don't even get project euros or dollars or pounds um, to do this work right now, but you still need to do it if you want to have that influence over time. And so building that up takes some proactivity, and I think that's what a lot of companies right now in Europe and in the U.S., and probably in other countries as well, other uh, areas as well, is how do you build up that influence to have an impact on the direction of product, services, and experiences so that the business side and the engineering side um, allow you to have that impact? So, so in talking about that a little bit more, are there, are there things that are important in an organization these are the conditions in the organization for you, uh, XD strategy or uh, user experience strategy to take a foothold? Well, I think there's a maturity curve. Um, last year at UXTrat Europe, you know, Telefonica talked about their maturity curve. Um, and I, you just can't jump levels of maturity. It doesn't happen that way. You might hire an executive who suddenly makes a lot of progress. Uh, uh, so there may be a a turbo boost that comes from hiring a certain executive in a certain position. But in general, um, the organization is going to have to go through certain stages to get there. And I feel like that has to happen um, on a case-by-case -case basis as you begin to do your homework, as you begin to develop a point of view of where your company's um, products and services and experiences should be going. And then to find small wins where you can show that if we could do a little bit more of this, um, then we could win more with that. And then by that kind of influence from those successes. I was talking with a very traditional company yesterday uh, about doing a consulting project for them, and I had, to, I had to say, I think you're not really ready for that particular piece. I think instead um, what we should do is look at this particular aspect and build some credibility before moving on to something more aspirational. I guess, and linked to that, I'd are there sort of bar you know, what are the are there sort of common barriers to the success of getting experience design strategy um, happening in an organization? Well, I think one of the biggest barriers uh, is a trend that started what I don't know um, 2011, 2012 with agile and lean UX. Um, they brought a great deal of efficiency to the process, and I think that was really important. Um, as Michael Porter, you know, Harvard um, 
a business professor, uh, says efficiency uh, is not having a strategy. It, it's very important to management, but it's not strategic. It's not going to set you apart. It's not going to differentiate you from competitors. And I think that's um, the hindrance is that organizations are so bought into agile and into lean UX that they're not um, able to dedicate resources to uh, the strategic side. You know, often people in our field use a, a double diamond, a little double diamond here. <laughs> uh, the left diamond being the strategic aspect of product and service design and the right side being execution. I think that Agile and Lean have thrown UX, user experience, and experience design squarely into the right diamond and focused on what will help us get this out quicker, what will help us get this out more efficiently at lower cost. Super important. I mean, these companies are dealing with speed as a key criteria. And if you can't generate that speed and that efficiency, you're going to lose, you're going to lose people. You're going to lose sponsors. You're going to lose um, advocates uh, throughout the organization. So I get that that's very important. At the same time, if you don't know where you're going, but you just get there very quickly, that's not helpful. And so I think the strategy side is to have the kind of influence where you say the experience needs to go in a certain direction. We have some research, we have some data to back that up. We feel like it needs to go in a certain direction. And now beginning to influence the organization to say, give us <clears throat> the resources, the time, the energy that we need to go in the right direction um, and then to do it right and to get there quickly. But first, uh, getting those resources and that time um, to, to be able to collect data, to analyze data, <clears throat> to formulate models, etc. I think you know, formulating a, a quantitative uh, user model is, is key to that. Um, but in order to do that, that takes time. That takes resources. It takes energy. And I think that the biggest hindrance is the kind of conveyor belt, <clears throat> conveyor belt of releases that, that people are on that I just can see two weeks forward. Well, this, this doesn't work in a two-week time frame. It works in a, in a much longer time frame to, to be able to develop a strategy. I've, I've got very shared experience around that with regards to getting there quicker, but in the, are we going to the right place? The, so picking up on this, um, uh, it's a very, it's, it's a very, um, it's really working its way into IT organisations around the world, you know, sort of agile, and some lean UX, but I'm seeing more agile than anything. Are there other sort of, you, and when you travel the world and talk to uh, uh, sort of other people working in the experience design community, are there sort of themes that you're seeing around the world? Yes, I think what I mentioned earlier about there's a legacy strength to different companies. They have this strength that helped them be successful for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whether that's engineering, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's um, uh, IT uh, operations, um, retail operations, whatever the, the strength of that company is, is an asset, but it's also a hindrance to moving forward. And so I think the, the barrier of breaking into that inner circle um, with methodologies like customer journeys and, and immersive research, uh, things like that, um, analytics, processing, big data, for um, experience design, those are um, not easy to, to sell that into these uh, more traditional areas. In fact, a lot of people I talk to in different companies in different countries um, can't really get access to the people, to the documentation. Um, I was fortunate that uh, at Lowe's.com with Liz that we were sharing both of our sets of information, so I was able to see information that was critical to the development of the company, you know, not secret information, but um, things that were important to understanding the inner workings of the company. And that's a big barrier. If you can't get um, annual operating plans, if you can't get um, key strategic initiatives, if you can't get um, uh, forward-looking brand initiatives, it's difficult to develop ideas and develop processes that are going to use those ingredients to create a strategy on the experience design side. If you're only limited to what you currently have, testing screens and things like that, it's going to be difficult to have the kind of elevator pitch 
uh, that's meaningful to executives in the company because you don't know the language and you don't know what's current with them. And so I think that's a huge barrier that I do see very often. And again, the way uh, I advocate in our workshops um, to get around that uh, is to find an ally on the business strategy side. Find an ally that understands that companies that are changing, that the, in fact our, our theme for 2017 is transformation outward, transformation inward. In other words, tr we have to transform our products, services, and experiences to, um, to meet the needs of today's consumers, especially those who are younger, more digital. We have to change the way that we're doing products and services for that. That's transformation outward, but there's also a transformation inward that companies are not structured to produce compelling experiences in across platforms and across um, physical, digital worlds. They're just not ready for that to produce those kinds of innovative experiences. And so that's transformation inward. And I think that balance of uh, transformation outward and transformation inward is, is a theme I'm seeing across many, many companies and countries. And are there any differences, like a sort of a big differences that you're seeing between, say, North America and Europe or in Asia um, in this sort of thinking? Well, I think we have um, uh, differences even within those areas. Yes. There are differences across those areas. I'm not as familiar with Asia uh, as we started to try to, and you're very familiar with this, um, but as I tried to put together a UX Strat Asia, um, I discovered that, that Asia is a construct of the European imagination. <laughs> there's, there's really no Asia. It's, um, it's countries, and those countries are quite different, and they expect um, different kinds of events. And so I'd say I don't know about Asia. It's just, um, to me, it's country by country. Some of them are very mature in their experience design aspects. Some are, are not very mature. Um, in Europe and the U.S., it's a little easier to see. They've been at it for a while. We've had different kinds of companies um, take precedence in, in those areas. Um, but even within the U.S. and Europe, I would say that there's different um, levels of maturity. So if I go to, I'm going to San Francisco in a couple of weeks. I, I gave a workshop at Facebook a couple of weeks, a uh, few weeks ago. Um, and I'm going out uh, to SAP to do um, a set of workshops. When I'm in, in the West Coast, everybody already speaks the language. They already know what I'm talking about. They have already done lots of projects like that. And so as as they begin to hear about you know, different ways to use big data to, to drive design innovation, it's already their natural language. They don't, you know, culturally they, they're ready for that. Um, if I'm in other areas of the U.S., not as much. Um, it's more about um, trying to get engineering to listen to them, trying to get engineering to um, take some things that they're saying into consideration, trying to get business leaders to understand that experience is the battleground uh, as uh, as as many of those leaders are saying but the company below that isn't necessarily ready for that in europe i'd say it's the same thing that um i would say it's more hierarchical in europe uh, more of a focus on service design rather than product design it's not universally true uh, but uh, i would say i hear a lot more about service design in europe than i do in the u.s and product design is very firmly entrenched in the u.s uh, and then again on the 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 team side of things, it seems that the European companies have more of a hierarchy of positions where if you want to change the structure, it's going to take you a while. Uh, whereas in the U.S., it seems to be a bit more fluid and a little less well-defined as to who's able to have the next um, idea or the next uh, plan. Um, but in general, I'd say there's more of a difference between the the vanguard uh, in uh, the U.S. and Europe versus the laggards in both. I'd say there's more of a difference there than, than across the continents. So, so talking about the role of the strategist, I mean, how would you describe the role of the experience design strategist? Uh, well, some people are fortunate enough to have that title a lot more than... I, I see everybody that joins the, the UX CX strategy group on LinkedIn. So I see every title. I approve every person. Um, so I see the title coming up a lot more often uh, today than, I guess, 2011 when I started the group. Um, so some people are fortunate enough to say, your job is to create a strategy for us. Uh, that title might also be UX director. Uh, it might be product owner, um, product manager. Um, these might be the titles, uh, but they have been given the mandate to, to create a strategy for um, uh, the products and services 
I do feel like product strategy, though, is um, limited in some ways, that experience design strategy is broader than that. Um, I think experience design focuses on experience of our customers, employees, etc., uh, whereas product focuses on a product or a service. Product and service to me is looking at something that we're doing, it's something internal, it's, it's this thing that we're making, um, or this process that we're making, whereas experience is sort of an, uh, a focus around the customer. To me, that's a Copernican revolution, if you will, something that focuses not on us and what we're doing, but on this experience that somebody's having. Um, other folks don't have the title. Uh, I'd say most people that are going to be involved in experience design strategy don't have a title necessarily that gives them that right. And that's when the hard work begins of building influence. And that's what our workshops are about, is how to build that kind of influence. But in that case, I'd say it's, it's more of a, a referent or um, an inferred type of leadership where you begin to shop around your map of the world, your models that you've created, uh, your understanding of what moves the needle in your particular organization and what's going to move the needle further, what trends are happening in the marketplace, what um, consumers are looking to, uh, especially younger, more digital consumers. And so I'd say that's more of an informal authority that um, comes from doing your homework and presenting models at key times and perhaps saying no to some projects that are very... Um, uh, uh, execution focused and um, perhaps where you can't really add that much value and then using that time that you've purchased uh, with saying no use some of that time to make a difference in uh, in a highly visible um, product or service or experience that your your company's designing and then use that informal uh, authority then to say and if I had more resources and and more um, time etc uh, to, to build this, then we could have an even greater impact moving forward. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I think sometimes you, tr you have to try and be the smartest guy in the room because actually organisations who are trying to grapple with this idea of how we're going to reinvent ourselves and what we are and how we engage and create value for customers... Uh, the real knowledge of that is not sitting with senior people. <laughs> it's sitting with the people who are probably closest to what real customers do, how they feel, and actually where the opportunities really lie around this. So I totally agree with that, Paul. I mean, is there any specific advice that you would give for someone who wants to pursue a career in experience design strategy? Yes, first of all, I would say, um, are you sure? Uh, because some people like to design things and like to sit down with Photoshop and Illustrator and, um, and, and make things. And I think that's awesome. Um, I'm not that gifted in that area. So I kind of, uh, I am um, very familiar with information and information design and information um, uh, architecture processes, things like that. Uh, but I'm not a designer per se. And so if you really love design, it's not to say that you can't be a strategist, but if you are, you might be focused on other kinds of things, uh, more metrics, numbers, um, KPIs, key performance indicators. Your time of your day is not necessarily going to be crafting a cool interaction that has nice you know, uh, movement, nice narrative, etc. And so I'd, I'd ask, first of all, are you sure? Is that really what you'd like to see your career do? If it is, um, then first thing to do is to do some homework. How does your company uh, or your agency's clients, how do they actually make money? Uh, and a lot of designers don't know that. Why did you have a down year last year? Or why was this competitor doing better than you in the marketplace? Who's, who's the long tail competition that's coming up rapidly with a great new experience? As a designer working on two week sprints for releases, you may not have that kind of an insight or maybe even that kind of um, information coming to you. So it requires homework in your market of knowing what, what's happening, what moves the needle, what's, uh, what kind of data do we collect. Um, I've been to cubicles around the world or open work environments around the world, and I often see on designers' walls um, typography or really cool images or color palettes. I rarely see a graph of any, <laughs> here's what my design did last month <laughs> in terms of results. Here's, here's my results. 
Um, it's kind of like how my family uses our, our credit cards, you know, just use it. Who knows what happens, how it gets there, you know, the sink still has some water in it. So let's just keep, you know, using it. So some designers don't take a results focus to their work because it's, it's scary. You know, it's like looking at your value in numeric terms. It's scary to look at the bank balance and say, oh my gosh, how did that much money leave so quickly? Um, and so I think the, the second thing um, is to begin to focus on how you actually make money for your clients or for your company or your products, etc. And then the third thing I would say is to begin to build bridges with people. If you like to work alone and just have your beats on and just be in your zone and kind of do your work, strategy is probably not the, the area for you because you're going to have to meet with people. I'd say the first person I would want to meet with in, in my company or in my client's company is the, a business strategist so that I can get synced up to with where that business is going and to get the inside scoop on what's important to the business today and for the coming year. Um, another relationship to make with is an IT. They're probably doing a lot of the architecture and that has an impact on how you can build um, things. Uh, as you mentioned in your talk with Sarah from Shell uh, last year, there's a lot of moving parts behind the scene. If you want to influence customer experience in a large corporation, there are a whole lot of departments like the finance department, you know, like operations. Uh, and as designers, people may not feel that comfortable uh, as information architects, interaction designers, um, uh, content strategists. Those may not be people you have immediate access to. So I'd say build some bridges and take some time to take people to lunch. You know, one one lonely person in the company that I often find is the data scientist or the data science group. They're kind of walled off and they do reports for executives and they use uh, uh, fancy um, analytics packages and they're doing these highly aggregated metrics for executives. So they kind of, they like it. They're dealing with data, they're dealing with executives, they're happy. But we need their data. We need to understand what's happening. Some of the best projects I've ever done in consulting have been where I said, no, actually, can you give me a password to the analytics package? Let me just see what's happening. And then some strange things really turn up when you dig into the analytics, you know, hour after hour, and you spend time seeing what are, what's actually happening here. And so I'd say befriend the, the data analyst. And at first, they're going to be very suspicious of you and, <laughs> and, um, and say, well, exactly what do you want to know? You know, exactly what metric do you want? And that's the easy way out for them. Um, they can just give you that one metric. But instead say, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's the kind of questions I'm trying to answer. Can you construct something like this? And so I'd, I'd say building a relationship with a data science group is very important. Um, and then once you had, have those relationships, I would say um, the next level after that to me is to, uh, is to bring data is to take a data-focused approach to what you're advocating in terms of strategy. I don't think anybody's going into a business strategy meeting at any sizable company and saying, well, I, th I think we should do this. You know, I really feel like we should. Uh, you know, Bob likes it, Sue likes it, um, uh, and, I, you know, I feel good about it. I think this is the direction we should go in. That's not how business strategy works. It's numbers. You know, it's metrics. It's competitive metrics. It's market data. It's historical data. Um, and so I'd say the next step is to become comfortable with data and have your ideas synced up to data. Um, when people, when I give persona um, uh, workshops in the, in the UX strategy workshop, when I give the persona section, I say if it's not built on data and if it's not wired to data coming out of the personas, it's just a story. It's a, it's a good story and it's helpful to people to gain some empathy for customers and to kind of understand what they're up against as they try to use our products and services. But as far as a predictive model, it's not. And you can't base something that you made up <laughs> and expect it to then be something real. It's, you know, you made it up before and now it's still made up. Um, so I'd say uh, getting comfortable with data means like in a persona or a user model uh, or archetypes, data has to go into it. And then it has to be wired to data afterwards with scorecards, et cetera, so that you say, here's how successful we were. When we did that new release, it was mainly targeted to this segment. Um, and from that segment, we can see these bumps or not uh, after the release. And that tells us something about the strategy. Is that, is that a good strategy? 
Finally, Paul, so what excites you most about the future for the uh, experience design strategist? Well, I don't think we could be in better times <laughs> than we're in. I mean, I don't, I don't think... I, I've been in the industry quite a while. Um, I actually started designing user interfaces. I didn't say that earlier, but um, back in the 1980s at a pharmaceutical company, we act, our vice president actually bought us Macs. Um, uh, and that was when you know Macs were really new, right after the commercial uh, um, for bringing Mac into the world. And so our company, very conservative company, bought Macs, and um, and I was responsible for designing a user interface for for one of the Macs. Uh, and so that was 80s, and then now it's 2017 as we're doing this interview. Um, I have not seen a better time for us than today. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited about the future. Uh, and also, just that we're, we're in the, the stream of the conversation. The world is changing. Uh, transformation, again, is our uh, UX Strat Conference's theme for this year. In that world of change, we're the ones helping to guide the ship forward. We're helping to guide the ship into successful winning strategies for the coming combination of um, physical things and digital things. And that, as, um, as many people are recognizing, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of, uh, of that. And I'm not speaking about kind of a dystopic matrix kind of machines rule the world, but rather that we can influence um, that direction that the world is going in, in terms of strategy, in terms of products, services, experiences, um, so that we guide it to a place that we want to live in. That, that we think is really cool and that's cool for our kids and, and the people we love and know. And so bringing that element of, um, of what's important to us, um, I would say that we're at the, at the leading front of where that should go. And, um, and I'm super excited about that. Paul, I absolutely share your excitement and I feel exactly the same way um, for the future of our profession and the community that work within that. Um, thanks very much for your time today, Paul. I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, reconnect with you. We're going to be talking to other uh, thinkers and leaders within the industry. Um, but thanks very much for your time. Well, thanks for allowing me to be part of this project. I'm excited about it. Great stuff. Thanks, Paul. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim.